In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, here at the seaside in Cliftonville, we can praise God who created all things. When we look at, for example, the majesty of the skies here in this part of the world, Turner, the great British artist, said they were the loveliest skies in all Europe. And there's something refreshing about gazing over the sea also a manifestation of the greatness of God's creation. People have always been able to see the beauty of God's creation, but nowadays we can see something greater in this beauty, I think, through the eyes of science. The application of the human intellect has penetrated greatly into the workings of the universe, discovering the vastness of space. People could always look out and look at the stars, but now we know something of the immense distances that are involved, or the enormous masses that are part of the interplay of the galaxies and stars and planets. The way in which the formation of our Earth depends on so much that has gone before in the great creation of God. And we also know at the other end of the scale something of the interplay of forces and, and matter at the level of fundamental particles. Again, these great minds looking at the structure of matter, the amazing complexity of the living cell, and the way in which things interact even within our own Earth. It's such a tiny part physically of the universe. And all of this is created according to the supreme mind of God. You may think our minds are clever, they're very, very puny compared to the supreme mind, intellect, or wisdom of God. Our universe is ordered, subject to laws and constants that we can discover by hard work and the application of brilliant minds, building one upon another, but in all that we discover, we unfold a wisdom that was there for ages upon ages before ever the earth existed, before any humans ever existed. The wisdom that's written into the very fabric of the universe itself as an expression of God's infinite wisdom. And the universe also has a purpose. Now here we rely not on the human intellect to discover but on the revelation of God, which he's granted us, to know, love, and serve him, so that we can know, love, and serve him properly. And in the Franciscan tradition, we see the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the birth of the second person of the Blessed Trinity in the flesh, as the meaning, the culmination, and the guiding principle of the whole of this magnificent creation from the very beginning until the end of time. And the incarnation of Jesus Christ was planned by God from the beginning. And therefore, the place of our Blessed Lady is also planned from the beginning in the mind of God. She's the woman who makes possible the way for this magnificent God who created this universe makes it possible for him to communicate with us in terms that can be understood by us. 
God is so vastly above us, so transcendent, we could never approach to understanding him. But God has made it possible. By the birth of Christ, God is not distant from us, but is as close to us as he can be. And that's only possible by the cooperation of the woman chosen by him from before the foundation of the world. Mary Immaculate, Star of the Morning, as we just sang fortuitously. Voluntarily, upon invitation and request from the Most High, she gives her own flesh for the formation of the human body of Christ. Our Lord is not, of course, conceived in the usual manner by the coming together of husband and wife, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, overshadowing the Virgin Mary. And since this is planned for by God from the beginning, we needn't see it as a violation of nature, but as something that's part of God's wisdom from all the ages, written into nature, in creation itself. Not a violation of nature or creation, but this is what creation was for in the first place, was for this conception, this birth to take place. And therefore this woman, our Blessed Lady, is there at the heart of creation. So when we say that Our Lady is the mother of divine grace, this is a title fundamental to her vocation, and indeed to the vocation of all creation. She's the mother of divine grace, first of all, because she is the mother of God, the mother of the incarnate word. No praise is too high for, for this vocation, or for Mary who accepted it, because it's instrumental in God's plan to give to all men and women a communication of his own life. Now God the Son, as we know, communicated with those who knew him on earth by human language, gestures, affection, friendship. And he communicated by his divine teaching, by his miracles, by his redeeming sacrifice on the cross, and by his glorious resurrection. All these ways our Lord could be seen, heard, touched. St. John himself, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have heard. And since he communicates at that time in that way, now he communicates with us in the church. He continues to teach through the magisterium, the official teaching of the church. We know when we look at the teaching of the church, which has remained constant in the tradition through the ages, occasionally reaffirmed solemnly by Pope or General Council. We know that that teaching is true. It comes from Christ. It is part of the deposit of faith. That's what, for example, Blessed Pius IX or Pope Pius XII said um, when they made the definitions of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption that this teaching uh, is defined to have been revealed by God and therefore to be believed by all the faith. I'm not proposing a new teaching, something that was given to the apostles as part of the deposit of faith. And the church guarantees that for us and will teach with a clear and certain voice in every age. That's Christ continuing to teach. Our Lord also continues to show us that affection and tenderness of his sacred heart by the outpouring of his grace in response to our prayers, our penances, our works of charity. And he continues to be our life through the sacred liturgy, most especially through the most holy sacrifice of the Mass. And if we're rightly disposed, we have the opportunity for that closest communion of all in the sacrament of Holy Communion. All of this all of this communication and participation that we have in the Godhead is made possible through Mary, whom God chose before all creation. We also call her Mother of Divine Grace in a more particular way. One of the titles that the Church gives to Our Lady is Mediatrix of All Graces. Now again, we could refer to her Motherhood of the Divine Son, uh, our Lord is the source of all graces, therefore Mary mediates him. But we can also hold that every grace, every particular grace, every actual grace, 
every increase in sanctifying grace is also given through the intercession of Our Lady, Mediatrix of all graces. Of course, Our Lady is not God or a goddess. She's not almighty in the way that God is through his absolute power. But St. Bernard and others, St. Bernard, of course, was a great medieval saint who spoke a lot about Our Lady, and he dared to say something which might be misunderstood by Protestants. Sometimes we have to, might have to explain it carefully to them. He said that Our Lady, we can speak of her as being almighty in her supplication, omnipotentia supplex. As a loving mother who is immaculate, free from all stain of sin, Our Lady never asks for anything that will not benefit us. And as a mother, her prayers are always in accord with God's will, and therefore they're always granted. When we gather on a day such as today to invoke her powerful intercession, we take actually a very sensible approach to our salvation, because nothing could be more effective for us than to invoke the prayers of the Mother of Divine Grace. Prayer to Our Lady is not an optional extra, as though it were just a sort of embellishment for enthusiasts. It is at the heart of our Christian faith, founded in the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. As St. Paul teaches, all things were created through him, for him, and in him, and in him all things hold together. Mary is necessary for this in the divine plan. So in a moment of teaching, surely prompted by the Holy Spirit, Pope Paul VI declared Mary to be the mother of the church, gathering together to give worship to Almighty God and praise and honor to the Blessed Virgin, we're united with the church throughout the world to implore those blessings which the church and the world so urgently need today. We could think of many, couldn't we? Every day, it seems now, there's a new atrocity. People are killed. We just were expected to go out and have a normal day that day. Or we think of the church herself and much confusion within the church, even over important things like marriage and so on, how much we need Our Lady's blessings and prayers. And may the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary be hastened by our devotions today. We also ask her personally to bless each one of us with those graces that we particularly need in our own circumstances. Maybe we're struggling with some health issue, perhaps somebody at home, perhaps we have a, a child or a grandchild who's fallen away from the faith, or even worse, is living a bad life in one way or another. Uh, so money worries, perhaps there's some psychological problem. Each of us has our own needs for which we ask Almighty God earnestly. And coming into this day today, being here in this church together, we invoke the prayers of our Blessed Lady herself. We ask that her Immaculate Heart might triumph also in us. So we should have confidence today the great juxtaposition at this part of the day, we have at the center our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, truly present in the blessed sacrament. That here for us, visibly here now, is the focus of the entire universe. That's what the universe was made for, is our blessed Lord here now, present before us in the blessed sacrament. God present among us as close to us as God could possibly be. That's what this entire universe is made for. And next to the Blessed Sacrament, our Blessed Lord himself, is the statue of Our Lady by which we remind ourselves that she rightly crowned, as we did first thing today, that she is the instrument, the willing cooperator with God himself chosen from before all time to give birth in the flesh to Christ, who is now with us today. Ave Maria. Hail, Mother of divine grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.